So uh, this is the fourth lecture of Professor Otto. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me uh, let me start by uh, going reminding uh, reminding us uh, on the slides where we are. So that's that's the uh, that's the main theorem I was mentioning last time. So, uh, uh, oops. Sure. Yes. So I can uh, I can write uh, write down a couple of things. So. Uh, um, so the uh, um, this minimizing so the thresholding scheme is as follows. Uh, so uh, you uh, uh, define chi n to be the characteristic function or the indicator function of the set where the convolution of the previous time step is larger than one half. And that's uh, uh, that's a minimizing uh, movement for um, the uh, energy functional, uh, which is given by uh, looking at um, u by uh, solving the heat equation with initial data u up to time t and looking how much of the mass has escaped into the uh, neighboring in the other phase and dividing by uh, 1 over square root of h. And the uh, distance function, and it's better to define it right away how it appears in the thresholding, is uh, defined as this uh, uh, square of a norm, u minus u prime gh convolved u minus u prime, uh, which I can also, by the semi group property, really write as uh, this expression. So that's the, uh, that's what you wanted to see. So that's, uh, that's, uh, those are the two definitions. And uh, so the statement, uh, statement is the following. So we, we have an initial configuration in the, uh, for the thresholding scheme E0, which has finite, which is characteristic function has finite parameter. That's this condition. And then we consider the, uh, 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 the, the solution which is given to us by the, uh, by the thresholding scheme. We look at the uh, piecewise constant interpolation, so chi h of t always is equal to chi n for t between nh and n plus 1h. Um, so chi, uh, chi h is the, uh, is the piecewise constant interpolation of uh, what you get out of the thresholding scheme. And uh, now the statement is, uh, suppose you're given any subsequence of time steps that goes to zero and a configuration chi, which is the limit in the sense that you have strong convergence in L1, so chi is again a characteristic function, and you have convergence of the time integrated energies. And that was kind of the, this, uh, this is uh, uh, kind of a benign assumption by the compactness result we, uh, I stated last time, but this is, uh, uh, this is an assumption which doesn't, uh, doesn't come for free. But however, uh, it has a tradition in, the, uh, in, this, uh, in this type of results. And if we make this, as a, this additional assumption, uh, we get convergence uh, towards uh, a Bracke solution in the sense there exists a curvature, which is a square integrable, and a curvature in this uh, usual weak sense, uh, where here you look at the tangential divergence on the interface. And uh, so it's defined by this uh, integration by parts formula on the interface. Uh, and uh, equipped with this curvature, uh, we have that uh, the uh, limit satisfies uh, mean curvature flow in the sense that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the family of Bracke's inequalities is satisfied 
so uh, in other words, that these, this family of localized dissipation inequalities is satisfied. So for any localizing function zeta, for any non-negative function zeta, uh, you look at the, uh, uh, at the local, local parameter, and now uh, uh, that's the dissipation inequality in a time-integrated fashion, which means uh, the localized energy at time capital T plus the integral of the dissipation is bounded by the localized energy at the, uh, of the initial data. And uh, um, so th this, is, this is a good factor of one half, which, had to do with, uh, uh, which has to do with the two here. So this is exactly with the right prefactor uh, Bracker's inequality. And, uh, and I remind you that there are these two terms. There is the first term, which would also be there if you would just look at the non-localized problem. Uh, where the dissipation rate is given by the curvature, mean curvature square, but then there is the second term, this transport term, which, uh, um, uh, which comes up uh, because of the localization and uh, involves the gradient of the localizing function. So that's the, uh, that's the main statement, uh, that uh, there is this conditional convergence towards, uh, towards a bracket solution, uh, and it's also true in the multi-phase uh, in the multi-phase uh, case, although here I'm, I'm just formulating everything in the single-phase case. Okay, so that, uh, that was the, uh, 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 the main theorem, which I stated last time. And, uh, and the idea is to uh, uh, get it from, uh, um, from the tools of De Giorgi, which uh, I introduced in, uh, in, the, in, in my first, uh, first lecture. So uh, uh, these tools for <coughs> metric... Um, uh, for gradient flows or minimizing movements in metric spaces, uh, namely the tool of a variational interpolation and the tool of uh, metric slope, which, uh, which allow you to uh, kind of get the right dissipation inequality uh, uh, with, the right, uh, with the right factor. And, uh, and the way we use it uh, here is by replacing, uh, replacing the uh, uh, the distance function in both places by the uh, uh, by the metric slope, and uh, uh, and that's uh, that's the way we're we're going to use it. So uh, there uh, there are two types of interpolations. There is the piecewise constant interpolation. There is the variational interpolation uh, in between. And uh, uh, and now uh, if you take both into account, you do get already on this time discrete level the right uh, energy dissipation inequality in the sense that the energy at a later time uh, is controlled by the energy at an earlier time plus the time integral of the uh, uh, metric slope squared. One half plus one half is equal to one, as it should be. And it's this, uh, it's, it's kind of the, the merit of, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the variational interpolation to get this uh, to get this, uh, this second term. And um, now the most, uh, the, yeah, okay. So, so uh, then uh, that, that was also a lemma which I stated and I kind of messed up the proof, but one of you found out that uh, there was no reason to uh, uh, get uh, anxious. Uh, the proof is okay. I can finish it today if you want. So, uh, uh, so in order to prove this, uh, 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 this convergence result, um, in order to prove this, these localized energy inequalities, uh, we don't work with this um, minimizing movement structure, but uh, we use uh, a second, I mean, uh, uh, the fact that uh, thresholding is also uh, minimizing movement, so uh, satisfies an entire family of minimizing movements. So for any non-negative uh, localizing function, which is sufficiently smooth, so C infinity is not important, but it has to be a couple of times differentiable, as you will see from the proof, uh, we have uh, that uh, um, uh, thresholding satisfies minimizing movements with respect to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to a different structure, 
where uh, it's easier to first write down the, uh, the metric. So uh, now I put, uh, to distinguish it from, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the standard structure, I put a tilde on the H. And, uh, and the only change here is that I smuggle in the, the localizing function there. And besides that, uh, this is unchanged. So and still the square of a norm, a norm provided zeta is strictly positive and not just non-negative. So that's the, uh, that's the definition and, uh, and the, um, the notation. <clears throat> so the only difference is that I smuggled in the cutoff function here and uh, I put the tilde here. And now, but for, uh, for, this, uh, for this to be true, I have to uh, modify the energy more substantially. So it has to uh, depend on the previous step. So it now depends not just on u, but also on a second uh, configuration chi. Of course, I put the twiddle. And uh, the uh, first term is, uh, follows the same principle as here. It's just uh, localizing the uh, energy from before. But then uh, there are uh, two correction terms which involve the uh, commutator uh, between multiplying by the localizing function and uh, convolving. That's an important correction term and then there is a correction term which always in the end will turn out not to affect anything which comes from smuggling in the, from in a certain sense, from the error, I mean, in principle, you would like to smuggle in the, uh, the cutoff function here, but you have to do it here, and the difference between these two uh, expressions brings in uh, another commutator, which involves uh, the, uh, 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 the, the kernel at time, uh, at half the time. Okay, so uh, so that's the uh, uh, that's the statement of uh, that's the statement of uh, of uh, lemma six. So uh, uh, and the proof is very much like uh, this here was uh, this here was lemma two, of which I gave uh, the full proof and I started giving you the proof of lemma six last time, but I messed up a little bit. Uh, but there is, uh, everything uh, seems fine. So, um, so that's the starting point. We have, a, we have a, if you want a localized, uh, a localized minimizing movement uh, interpretation of, uh, uh, of uh, the thresholding scheme. And now the next slide, and I kind of alluded to it already last time, is really perhaps the central idea. So let's, uh, let's, or kind of gives the, the central structure of the proof. So, uh, so this again is uh, the, uh, the correct, including the factor, the correct energy dissipation inequality for minimizing movements, which you get thanks to uh, the variational interpolation of De Georgi. So that was the main merit of, uh, uh, of what De Georgi did. Uh, he, uh, he kind of uh, recovered the missing one half uh, in front of the uh, in front of the square gradient term by introducing this uh, this adapted interpolation. So let me uh, um, let me uh, well I, I remind you of it in a second. And uh, now now we want to apply this to uh, uh, to our situation, uh, which uh, is a little bit more complicated because the energy functional depends on the previous time step. So there is this additional dependence on chi n minus one. And the energy functional is not named E, but E tilde H, but you know, that's just a different name. Um, but if you think a bit, a bit about it for a second, that doesn't constitute any, pro, uh, uh, pop, that doesn't, pull, uh, that doesn't uh, that's not a problem because uh, uh, you're just using this uh, inequality for one time step. So, uh, so that your functional depends on the previous time step is no problem at all in applying, uh, applying to, Georgie's, uh, to Georgie's idea. 
So uh, we can just copy this line and give the symbols uh, their more specific meaning. So we now use uh, uh, this uh, localized energy functional with fixed uh, uh, second argument. We, uh, we get the metric slope of that functional uh, in the first argument uh, at uh, place chi n, the metric slope uh, uh, of this functional, again with fixed second argument in the, inter in the variational interpolation. And let me remind you the definition of the variational interpolation. So, uh, so uh, u of uh, n minus 1 times h plus t, and I put a twiddle here and an h superscript, is the minimizer or is a minimizer of uh, exactly what belongs to this structure. So e tilde, e tilde h u chi n minus 1 plus 1 over 2 h d tilde square h uh, u chi n minus 1. Among all u and x, and remember x was the space uh, of non-necessarily characteristic functions. So, uh, uh, so this variational interpolation typically will not be a characteristic function because it has to satisfy this variation problem. That, sorry, and here is a t. This is now, there's no reason why this variation problem is minimized by a characteristic function. In general, it will not. But we don't care. We know that uh, it will stay close to a characteristic function or we'll use that it stay close to a characteristic function. But in fact, it's not a characteristic function. So, these, uh, this variational interpolation kind of leaves a little bit the geometric world by, uh, by, uh, by, by, taking this, uh, by taking this variation structure by the letter. Okay, and I put, a t I put, a tilde, I put a tilde on it because it's really the, the, uh, uh, the variational interpolation which belongs to this structure and not to the simplest structure. So, uh, of course, they would also give you different ways, different interpolations. But again, we, uh, we don't care. So, uh, so again, I mean, this, is, this was the abstract result by De Giorgi, where uh, the big thing is to get this red term. And now we just stupidly apply, mechanically apply it to our situation. And now, of course, uh, in order to, uh, to get kind of the, the dissipation inequality in the limit, you want to sum up this inequality. You want to, I mean, you want to sum up the time steps of this inequality. And now, because you have a, a kind of an energy functional which depends on, which has the second argument, you realize you don't have a telescoping structure anymore. So uh, if, you, uh, if you take this, uh, this energy, uh, energy inequality or this dissipation inequality and you sum it up, uh, then you have this telescoping property that uh, kind of these terms cancel. Now, this is no longer the case because here you have n, n minus 1, and here you have n minus 1, n minus 1. So that becomes a, it wasn't a problem going from here to here, but it now becomes a problem when we want to sum up. Right. So, uh, so we do sum up, and, uh, and because of this mismatch, uh, we have to, in order to still have something like the telescoping effect, we, have, uh, we get an error term, which is, this, uh, which is this red term, which exactly uh, uh, kind of monitors the difference of the energy functional in the second, if you want, artificial or you know, additional argument. So this red term here exactly is a consequence of the fact that telescoping uh, here fails. So you get an additional term. And now, but now this is in a certain sense already exactly the right structure, we have, a, we have the green term, which is kind of, in a certain sense, the original De Georgi term, which will converge, at least in a lower semi-continuous way, to uh, uh, the main curvature dissipation term. And it's, the, uh, uh, it's this term here, which will converge to the transport term with the right prefactors. 
So, uh, so the remaining proof is really now really uh, using very much uh, uh, the, uh, the philosophy of De Georgi that uh, in a certain sense this inequality calls for using lower semi-continuity methods and indeed on the green term we're using, uh, we, we just have one uh, kind of a convergence in the right direction, we're using a lower semi-continuity argument to go from here to here. In the other terms, by our assumption, we actually have uh, convergence. So, uh, uh, so that's really the structure of the proof. We just, uh, we just, uh, we just go from, uh, uh, from this discrete version of the dissipation inequality to, uh, to the continuum version of the dissipation inequality. So, so I hope, uh, I hope the, uh, the structure of the proof is clear. And now, uh, I'll ask you for questions, but uh, now I, I want to give you kind of the main two arguments why the green terms converge or converge in terms of an inequality and why the red term converges. So that's, uh, that's, what, I want to, uh, that's what I want to explain now. I, do you have questions? No questions? I can't believe that. So any, any definition you miss or any, uh, anything you want me to write on the blackboard? Okay, so, uh, so before, uh, before uh, kind of giving you more details, let me tell you what, the, uh, what now the, uh, the strategy is in going from, uh, going from here, uh, here to here. And, uh, and that uh, now uses uh, kind of, uh, yeah, the lower semi-continuity property built in to, uh, 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 to the metric slope. So let me, def let me, uh, let me recall, uh, recall how the, uh, how the metric slope was defined. So uh, very uh, generally, I mean, the definition by De Georgius, you have a functional, and, uh, um, and uh, you're interested in the metric slope uh, in a configuration U, and that was defined as uh, lim soup, uh, considering all uh, other configurations which approach U in your uh, metric, and then you're looking at the difference quotient E of u minus E of v uh, plus divided by du dv. And in fact, it's a matter of simple algebra that, uh, uh, and that's more you know, natural to look at. Uh, if uh, it's more natural, I mean, from the point of view of dissipation inequality, it's more natural to look at uh, the squared metric slope, and it's convenient to put the factor one half in there. And uh, uh, it's an easy consequence that that one, uh, and we just need this inequality, can also be uh, written in a more uh, quadratic term, and I don't need to put the plus here, minus one half d square u v. So, uh, uh, so if, uh, if this here were a linear form, then this is just simple linear algebra, and you just plug you just plug this estimate in here to get this inequality. So that's just uh, a little rewriting. And, uh, and now, uh, now here comes kind of, uh, here comes the, uh, the, main, uh, the main merit, or the, kind of the main idea in this lower semi-continuity argument, that uh, uh, since we're just interested in this type of inequality, uh, we are completely free to choose in which way we approach our configuration u here in this sequence. I mean, we're allowed to take any way, but we, take, we may take something that's convenient for our purpose. And, uh, and what's convenient for our purpose is to uh, kind of appro approach the, uh, the configuration uh, u, which now you should think of a characteristic function, in a, in a smooth way, like we, like we do it in, dif, you know, in differential geometry or in the calculus variations, namely by kind of deforming the set. So it's convenient to consider uh, uh, for a given vector field, uh, xi, so I always call vector fields xi, 
and let's assume that it's perfectly smooth. Uh, so for a given vector field psi, we consider the flow and we move the set uh, by the flow. In other words, we evolve the characteristic function uh, by solving this transport equation with initial data, so initial uh, S is just a parameter, a fake time, um, with initial data given by U. So that's, uh, uh, so, so now we take, uh, we take this curve, so instead of approaching this point U in configuration space uh, uh, in, in an arbitrary way, we take this uh, very specific uh, uh, way of approaching it. And uh, why do we do this? Because uh, that leads to, uh, 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 to the concept of, uh, of the first variation, because by definition, the first variation, uh, so here I use, so here I use a, a, a partial and here I use a del. Uh, the first variation of, uh, of a functional uh, in uh, the point in the configuration u in direction of the vector field psi is given by taking the derivative at s is equal to zero along this curve. And uh, that typically, and in our case, will be a linear functional in psi. So this is how, uh, that's one way, I mean, how you would define the first variation of the area functional. So it's the right geometric notion of gradient of first variation. And, uh, and now you can, uh, you, can just, uh, you can just do what I, what I, what I said. You can uh, uh, take this specific approach. And if you do that, you see that you get another uh, uh, lower bound where now you soup over all vector fields. And what you put here is the uh, first variation of uh, your functional uh, you Psi, and uh, okay. Now I have to uh, I have to choose uh, uh, I have to choose my metric. Uh, so perhaps I should do this uh, in uh, um, in the more specific case of the tilde problem. Uh, chi. So as on the blackboard, and here I should put the dot square at u controls uh, this quantity here. And here uh, we have a term which just comes, which is the infinitesimal, infinitesimal. Uh, so now we're, we're looking at, the, uh, at, the, at our specific metric. And we are approaching u along this nice curve. And we're, so we, 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 we're just interested at, at the infin, infinitesimal part here. And uh, that's exactly uh, uh, the, um, the expression which I've written down there. So there is the localizing function, there is the convolution with h over 2, and there is uh, psi dot uh, grad applied to u uh, squared. Okay, so, uh, uh, so that's what saves the day. This is uh, the fact that in our situation, the metric slope can be uh, kind of bounded below uh, by something that involves the geometric first variation of our energy functional, which gamma converges to uh, which gamma converges to the parameter functional, uh, so that the first variation kind of will converge to uh, to the first variation of the area functional. So the weak uh, the weak uh, weak expression for mean curvature um, that saves the day. And uh, then we have to worry about this term, but it will be a consequence of our convergence assumption that this term also converges to what it should converge to. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so this, uh, th here you see kind of really uh, the Georgie's ideas at work that you can use uh, inequalities the right way. So we've passed from, uh, from something which a priori looks kind of complicated, namely the metric slope, to something uh, that we're much more familiar with in, uh, in geometric analysis, namely the first variation. And if you want, the metric slope controls, uh, the first variation is a linear form, and the metric slope controls the norm of the linear form 
where the norm is taken with respect to this, uh, this, uh, uh, this norm here of Xi. So, uh, uh, so that's, that's, that, that's perhaps the most, Im most important idea, and that's exactly what you would hope from, uh, uh, from getting from de Georgie's uh, approach, that you get these kind of b benevolent inequalities which work in your favor. That's exactly, I think, what, uh, what, uh, what one hopes from this, uh, from this type of approach. Okay, so, uh, and, uh, and now the crucial, uh, the crucial ingredient is that uh, when you look at the first variation, uh, now we have, uh, we have our uh, strange modified localized energy functional, which is the localized energy functional, but then it has these two error terms, that at least on the level of the first variation, the, uh, uh, the localization uh, just acts trivially. So, I mean, if you, if you want to use fancy words, uh, you might say that localizing the energy functional and taking the first variation commutes. Because here what's stated is that if you take the first variation of the localized energy functional, the answer you get is the non-localized energy functional, but with the localized first variation. So the Xi kind of goes from sitting in the functional to sitting in the, in the variation. And it's not exactly true, but it's true uh, to, uh, 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 it's, it's, it will be true in the limit because this, uh, this expression here can be estimated by something which depends on high norms of our localizing function and on high norms on this vector field. But that's again the nice thing about the soup formulation. We can fix, when we pass to the limit, we can fix the vector field and then you know, take the supremum at the end, you know, that's the basic idea how you prove lower semi-continuity of norms or, for instance, the BV norm, so one's using the same trick here. So there's no problem uh, with the fact that this here depends on, 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 on the localizing function and depends on the, on, on, on the test vector field. And what's important is that uh, what you get here on the right-hand side is something which you control by the energy estimate, at least when you integrate in time, times something that goes to zero with, you know, power one-fourth, but you don't worry, uh, goes to zero as h goes to zero. So that's, in a certain sense, a consistency. I mean, if I were a numericist, I would say this is a, this is a certain consistency property of the scheme. Okay, so um, that's, um, <clears throat> that's, uh, so this will, uh, this will help us to, uh, to pass to the limit uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the green term, and you would yeah okay so uh, so now what's more uh, what's slightly more subtle is to uh, uh, to pass to the limit in the uh, in the in the other term in the red term perhaps I should uh, kind of write this down somewhere uh, so. Uh, so before taking the limit, we have uh, uh, the H tilde functional um, evaluated, excuse me, at uh, chi H T. Second argument is chi H T. By, by the way, if, uh, if uh, in, this, uh, in this localized energy functional, if both arguments are the same, then these additional term, terms drop out, and it's really just the localized uh, energy functional. So that's, uh, that's a good expression. And then we had uh, plus uh, the integral from zero to t, uh, one half of the uh, metric slope of E h tilde with fixed uh, chi h t uh, at chi h t plus h. And here I put the square plus one half uh, metric slope of E h tilde uh, at chi h t, but now evaluated at the, uh, met at the variational interpolation, d t. So that was uh, uh, the curvature term, and then we had the term uh, which will give rise to the transport term, one over h E h tilde chi h t plus h chi h t, 
minus E H tilde chi H T plus H chi H T plus H close this bracket dt is less or equal than E H tilde chi zero chi zero so that was the uh, that was the inequality and we want we want to see that this goes to let me just write it in exactly the same order Principle it goes to this here with uh, the C, C zero sitting everywhere here. So that's uh, that was uh, that's the uh, that's the main that's the main task. Okay, and uh, and uh, uh, and so the fact that we can lower bound this expression. By uh, an expression fixing the fixing this test vector field by the first variation, and that, as I will point out, we have good convergence of the first variation because of our convergence assumption. We're hopeful that uh, we can go from here to here uh, because we also understand the limit of this term again because of our convergence assumption. So, uh, so at least in this sense, it will converge and. Uh, but uh, uh, what I now have to tell you, or before getting into more details, why, uh, why we have the second convergence. Okay. And uh, so that's, that's, uh, lemma, that's lemma eight. So here it is. So, uh, so again, uh, that's kind of a very general lemma, which in a certain sense is a consistency result. Uh, and uh, uh, again, it takes, it looks at two general uh, configurations, u and chi. Chi, although I use the letter, doesn't have to be a, a, um, a, a, a characteristic function. And here we're looking exactly at this type of difference, which, which is sitting here. So we're looking at, uh, at the difference quotient, if you want, of, the, uh, of this localized energy functional in this additional argument. So that's exactly what we need for here. And we have exactly the same combination, u, chi, u, u. So that's clear that we will need something like this. And what turns out is that uh, this here can be related to the first variation of the uh, metric, the non-localized metric. So in fact, uh, this term is to leading order equal up to f factor one half, which I forgot last time. Uh, is, is equal to uh, the first variation of the metric expression in direction of the vector field which is given by the gradient of the localizing function. So that's slightly, uh, slightly more uh, non-trivial or you know, more subtle than the, uh, than the previous lemma that one has this, uh, this type of relationship. And again, there is an error which uh, because by the standard a priori estimates, we, we control this here in L2 in time, this in L1 in time, this in L infinity in time, we get a certain order here, which uh, again is as bad as H 1 fourth, but we don't care. And uh, now why, uh, now how, how, how do we get the connection uh, between uh, this discrepancy uh, term here, which is sitting here, and uh, a curvature term, which is where we want to get to, to this term here. Well, there, uh, in a certain sense, all we have to use is the Euler-Lagrange equation for this original variational principle, for the original minimizing movement scheme for thresholding. So the fact that uh, thresholding satisfies this non-localized uh, 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 minimizing movement scheme, which we proved in lemma two, uh, because just taking the Euler-Lagrange equation, so using the fact that it's stationary, uh, we get this relationship. We get the relationship, I forgot a minus sign here, we get the relationship 
that the, uh, uh, that the uh, first variation of the metric, of the metric term uh, in direction of some arbitrary vector field xi is equal to minus times the first variation of the, uh, uh, of the non-localized energy functional. And now that's exactly, this identity is exactly what you plug in here, uh, and the only change is that, uh, 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 that, you get the, uh, um, that you get the gradient of the cutoff function, which plays the role of the first variation, and that's exactly this term. In the continuum limit, that's exactly this term. Your, your, uh, uh, the, gradient of xi, the gradient of the cutoff function plays the role of the vector field in which direction you're taking the first variation of the area functional. So this is, uh, so now, now you should see, if you don't see, ask me, ask me question, you should see that it's not at all surprising that, uh, uh, that this, uh, this term here, which, uh, which is related to the fact that the energy functional depends uh, on, on, on this additional variable, exactly gives rise to the transportation term. So, uh, are there, are there any questions with respect to, uh, to the statements or the strategy? Yeah? I'm sorry? Yes, so, so in a certain sense, um, uh, so this is, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, that's the term which comes from the DH we have to pass to the limit to. And now if you, if you think about this, um, how, does it, uh, uh, how, does it, uh, uh, how does it look like? Uh, uh, so this is something which uh, one has to do in, in, uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the process of the proof. Um, so let me copy it here. So, uh, so I'm, 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 I'm using kind of this operator type uh, uh, notation where this here acts on everything which comes afterwards, but now let me put the brackets there. So uh, um, you can kind of massage this term a little bit to see that uh, essentially it is, um, <coughs> it is given by, uh, uh, by the following expression. So, you can, uh, uh, you can, so this here is equal to uh, the divergence of u times xi minus this term. Uh, that term doesn't play a role uh, in the limit, uh, so you're left with this one. This one gets on, you can put this in the convolution, you can put this onto, uh, onto the g function, and uh, so, what you get is uh, this, type of, uh, this type of expression. Uh, and uh, okay, and, and there's another argument which tells you that uh, as h is small, you can kind of pull this psi out. And you would, ah, I forgot the, ah, I should forgot the square, sorry. There should be a square. Uh, there's a square here. Uh, you pull the xi out, so it gets xi square, and here you get uh, uh, this type of expression. Okay, so uh, uh, so this is all. I mean, this can be controlled very well, and just depends on the smoothness of xi. And now, if you look, if you look for a moment at this term, what is this term? Well, I mean, here, uh, here you have something u is something which approaches or is a characteristic function. You're taking its convolution, and then you're taking the gradient of the result. So that will be something that's very steep uh, near the interface. But you're scaling it in the right way so that this here, uh, now, I'm, now I've treated, I, I did another bad thing. I've treated xi as a scalar, but I should really write it like this. So. Uh, uh, so this here will, in a certain sense, converge to the normal. So this thing here converges up to perhaps this constant C0 uh, to this expression. So, uh, 
So what this, uh, uh, what this metric term is picking up is the, or this first variation of the, or this infinitesimal version of the metric term is picking up is really the normal, comp the L2 norm of the normal component of the vector field by which you flow. And that's exactly the, uh, that's exactly the metric structure which you would expect for uh, mean curvature flow, right? I mean, that's the formal inner product, the L2 norm on the interface. Now, here's this little twist that uh, we did it uh, not, uh, uh, not with respect to, uh, 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 to the original metric function, but uh, with respect to the localized metric function. So therefore, you have this, uh, this cutoff function sitting here. But the cutoff function is also sitting here by the lemma which I had before. And uh, that leads to the fact that the cutoff function is also sitting here. So, uh, um, so that's, uh, that's fine. So that gives, you, that gives you perhaps a little bit of an intuition uh, that this metric term, at least in its infinitesimal version, is related to what it should, namely the L2 scalar product on normal velocities. Well, I mean, here you just, uh, so the, 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 the advantage of this one, you, you, you're not looking at the distance function in the large, which has the same problem. You're looking, you, I mean, you're just looking at the infinitesimal part of it. I mean, here, that's, uh, you're not looking, uh, I mean, when you, when, when you do this lower bound, you're not looking at the metric in the large, but you look at the infinitesimal part of the metric by, you know, I mean, this behaves like S squared times that expression. And so therefore, you circumvent this problem with the fact that uh, uh, this metric in the large is, is badly behaved because in the end, it's just the infinitesimal, the metric tensor in the Riemannian sense that plays a role. Um, that wouldn't make much. Uh, that wouldn't make much sense. I mean, yeah, this this uh, 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 like in, in a certain sense, like in the Andre and Taylor Wong scheme, uh, this uh, this metric term is is a reasonable term only kind of close by, and it would have a kind of a different meaning, a non kind of let's say non physical meaning if you look at two uh, two distant configurations. It's, uh, it, well, I mean, it's, a, it's the same thing with Alan Kahn, right? Alan Kahn is the, uh, is the gradient flow of Ginzburg-Landau with respect to bulk L2, the bulk L2 inner product. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, so. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the Ginzburg-Landau functional. And now if you look at the L2 uh, bulk, so let me stick to my periodic uh, uh, gradient flow of this, you get the Allen Kahn equation. With, uh, I don't want a quarter here, so. Um, right, and uh, so, uh, uh, so the Allen Kahn equation is the, uh, is, has a gradient flow structure. But it's not the right gradient flow structure of the limit because while the functional converges uh, in the sense of gamma convergence to the perimeter, you're changing the metric. You're going from bulk L2 to surface L2. So, so also, I mean, I could write down a minimizing movement scheme for, uh, for the Allen Kahn equation based on this metric and I would know by standard PDE theory that this is a good, I mean, that this scheme converges, but now, you know, there is this interchange of limits, and, uh, and it wouldn't really make sense if you're interested in mean curvature flow in the end to, uh, to give a lot of importance to this bulk L2 metric. And it's, uh, it's uh, I would say it's a little bit uh, the same thing that's, uh, that's, uh, that's taking place here. It's really the infinitesimal, it's really how it acts on, uh, on close by configurations that matters. So, more questions? Okay, so, uh, 
Uh, right. So that's uh, that's 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 in a certain sense. Now that's the uh, those are the two uh, uh, those are the two main steps uh, main steps of the proof. And I th I hope uh, I hope the structure uh, uh, the structure of the argument is clear. And I hope uh, you see that uh, it really uh, kind of uses the uh, uh, takes benefit of uh, of the uh, of the ideas of uh, of the Georgi uh, on on on, uh, on gradient flows. So now I can do several things. Um, I can uh, kind of fix uh, uh, fix my proof of uh, of lemma six and go back to uh, where I what I started last time and uh, uh, close that. Uh, but in the end, it's a little bit of boring algebraic uh, 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 calculation, uh, very much uh, 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 as in very much in the same style as lemma two. So there is no mystery. I mean, it's just in a certain sense, of course, we did reverse engineering, right? I mean, we said, well, we, somehow we want to have this functional and this metric. What are the terms we have to put there uh, so that it works out? And, uh, and, and the proof kind of just is, uh, is, is, uh, works the other direction. So there's not, it's not <clears throat> nothing, nothing deep. It's just, uh, I mean, in a certain sense, I mean, it's clear that these two terms which you add have to vanish when xi is constant, when zeta is constant, clear. These commutators are zero when this is a constant function because multiplication with a constant function commutes with everything. And in a, in a, in a certain sense, these terms just uh, just monitor how 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 much you have destroyed symmetry by uh, smuggling in uh, smuggling in kind of a cutoff function, and uh, uh, which prevents you from kind of using symmetry uh, in in the way uh, in the way you want. So it's. I can do it, but it's uh, it's not inspiring. Uh, I can go back to uh, uh, to the proofs which I given uh, didn't give you uh, um, uh, uh, on uh, Tuesday, uh, or uh, I can uh, give you the proofs of these two lemmas, or one of them. So, uh, what's the uh, What's the what's the vote? Who wants to see? Uh, who wants me to go back to let's say the compactness proof and that kind of stuff? One person. Who wants me to go? I mean to uh, finish uh, finish this uh, proof of lemma six. One per two persons. Uh, and who wants me to go on with uh, seven and eight? That's somewhat more the majority. Okay, so then I, I get, if I mean I. There might be time for the other stuff too. Okay, so uh, um, so let's uh, go back to uh, lemma seven because that's uh, a bit easier and uh, gives you already the uh, oops uh, the main idea. So what can I raise? Uh, so essentially, I need the definition of the first variation. Because it's a statement about the first variation, and uh, uh, and I don't need this. So, by the way, I mean I've. Uh, so, for those people who don't believe that I fixed the proof of lemma six, uh, it's. Uh, I mean, of course, it might still be a mistake, but we can. Post it if you want again. Okay. So let me see how I wanted to do this. Lemma seven, right? So, uh, um, so there is um, there's first so proof of lemma seven. So there is uh, the first step is is just a, a representation of the quantity which uh, uh, which we want to look at. So the first uh, first variation of the localized energy functional with fixed configuration chi at configuration u uh, in direction of the vector field psi minus. Uh, the first variation of the unlocalized energy functional uh, in the 
configuration xi in direction of zeta times xi. So that's the quantity we want to, uh, we want to estimate. And uh, it can be written as 2 over square root of h, uh, g h over 2, u minus chi, times uh, zeta g h over 2, uh, psi gradient u. So that's the, uh, that's the formula. And then from this formula, we get the, uh, uh, we get the estimate by estimating this, uh, this remainder term. So let's, uh, let's, first, uh, let's first get this, uh, get this formula. So, uh, uh, so we, have to look at, uh, we have to look at what these, uh, uh, what these expressions are using the definition of the, uh, using the, definition of the uh, uh, first variation. And so uh, let's start with, uh, with the first term, which is the first variation of this term. So wherever there is a u, we get a term. So, uh, um, uh, so we'll get a term from here, from here, from here, from here, and from there. Is that correct? So many terms? I th I'm afraid so. Yes. And, uh, and then, of course, we get also terms from here. So uh, 1 over square root of h, and everything is under the integral, uh, zeta. So, uh, for the first term, we always get, uh, I mean, the, whenever we plug this in, uh, the expression we get is uh, uh, the operator, the directional derivative in direction xi of u uh, with a minus sign, but there is a minus sign sitting here. So for the first term, it's a plus sign. Uh, but then uh, for the second term, we get a minus sign, uh, 1 minus u gh. Uh, Grad uh, xi, grad u, uh, and then we get one from here minus uh, xi grad u uh, zeta g h over two uh, convolved with one minus chi, and we get uh, uh, two from the last term uh, minus uh, xi grad u. Uh, zeta g h over 2 um, g h over 2 uh, u minus chi that's the first term and the last term is minus uh, chi uh, u minus chi uh, zeta g h over 2 uh, g h over 2 rat uh, chi rat u so nothing has happened. I've just mechanically uh, replaced, uh, uh, replaced, uh, replaced things. And uh, so that's, the, uh, that's this term. And now we have to take the first variation of, uh, uh, of this energy. Of course, that just gives us two terms. Uh, the first term is, uh, so I continue with the integral. So the first term is uh, zeta psi gradient u g h u. That's nice because it will just cancel with this one. And the second term is uh, plus uh, zeta, no, there's no zeta here, 1 minus u g h uh, zeta psi grad u. And uh, we're left with all the other terms. So, uh, so the fact that these two cancel uh, is already pointing in the right direction. And now we have to uh, see uh, that uh, there is a substantial simplification with the other terms. And that was a bit uh, uh, subtle, uh, not deep. So we have to use, uh, we have to use the kind of anti-symmetry of a couple of these terms. Uh, of, of, uh, of the commutators. So, and, uh, so let me continue here. And so let me see, first of all, whether I copied everything correctly here. Uh, all right. 
this here, this term I can right away combine to commutator. Uh, this term here is the commutator of, so I can write it as minus one minus u, uh, commutator of uh, zeta gh uh, xi red u, right? That's, that's this term. So the first term goes away, and the difference of these two terms just gives rise to commutator. So now we just have commutators, and the idea is essentially to uh, organize things in such a way that, uh, uh, that these products, uh, I mean, all these terms have the structure of function, operator, function, and you organize the terms in such a way that uh, the, uh, uh, that this term here, uh, this, uh, this directional derivative is in the second argument. And if you, uh, if you do that, uh, uh, you have to switch the order here, for instance, and uh, so you have to use that uh, this operator here is anti-symmetric. I mean, the commutator of two symmetric operators is naturally anti-symmetric. So when you switch the order in this product, you change the sign. And uh, I hope that's what, that was the right logic uh, to give me, for the first term here, um, now the first term I'm happy with. Uh, so I just copy it, but there is a simplification between the first term and the second term. Why is that the case? Because let's do that uh, for a second in, uh, in a different color. So if here I do exactly what I said, I uh, uh, change the order, one minus chi, uh, uh, zeta gh over two uh, xi grad u. So I've done exactly what I said. Of course, it's pointwise it's not true, but it's true after integration. I see that there is a certain cancellation between these two terms. And what I'm left with is uh, the term u minus chi, uh, zeta gh2 uh, xi red u. So, uh, so now we're done up to here, and we're just left with, uh, with these two other terms. And uh, now I think what I said uh, should be okay. I'm freeing. Uh, I'm freeing everything. I mean, uh, I, uh, I I change the order here. Here I'm already in the right order. And if I do that, uh, I see that what I get uh, as the structure. So that was the term which we got from here. Here I'm uh, here I'm switching order once more. So I get uh, uh, the minus turns into a plus sign, gh over two convolved with the commutator. And here I'm, I'm fine, so I just copy that. h over two, gh over two. Okay, so, uh, and now I have to see that this expression simplifies, um, and indeed it does by kind of, in a certain sense, by spelling out what these commutators mean, you see that this here is nothing else than two times uh, uh, the commutator which is sitting here. Uh, two times gh over two, zeta gh over two, uh, yeah. And, uh, and then the last thing to do is to bring this here on the, uh, the left-hand side, which is what we did there. Okay, so it's just, uh, it's just uh, this type of uh, 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 straightforward calculation which, uh, which brings uh, what, what you expect to be small into a nice form. And, uh, uh, and of course, it's not, perf it's not the right type of thing to do on the blackboard. But uh, now, now we can estimate this term. That's, uh, uh, so this is if you want algebra, and now comes the analysis. And the, um, uh, so let me uh, erase this here. So the second step is uh, um, uh, estimate of the left-hand side. Uh, 
and this here was uh, right hand side, of course. I'm always getting confused with left and right. So, uh, okay, so what th this, this certainly cries out for uh, using Cauchy Schwarz because uh, here, uh, if, we, if we take the L2 norm of the first factor, we get something uh, which we control, namely uh, our, uh, our distance function, which we uh, afford, can afford. So, uh, by Cauchy Schwarz, uh, this is estimated by. Um, so, I don't care for constants now. So, let's forget about the two. Uh, GH over 2 uh, U minus chi squared, and uh, the commutator, GH over 2. Uh, xi red u squared square root. Okay, so that was just Cauchy Schwarz. And, uh, uh, and we're happy with the first term because this here is equal by our definition 1 over 2 square root of h, uh, the distance function, the non localized distance function between u and chi. And uh, and now all we need is that this term is bounded. Because if this term is bounded, controlled by some derivatives of, uh, of the cutoff function and the test vector field, then I get the right powers of h here. Uh, this is a square, I'm taking square root, so I get the metric to the power one and I get 1 over h3, 4, which I can write as 1 over, it's h 1 quarter times 1 over h, which is exactly the right-hand side. So the only thing is to convince ourselves that this, uh, that this term is bounded. And uh, now a priori, this looks, uh, uh, this looks a bit dangerous because I have a gradient on u, and u is a characteristic function, or close to a characteristic function, and not only am I taking the L1 norm, which would be okay, I'm taking the L2 norm. So, uh, uh, so certainly it's not, a, it's not a naive estimate which I can use here. And uh, so some of you will know that uh, um, commutators have regularizing properties. So uh, if, you have, uh, if, you have, uh, if you have the commutator between a smooth function and, uh, 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 and, uh, and a differential operator or kind of uh, an, uh, some type of Fourier space operator, then the commutator has better regularity properties, has better smoothing, smoothing properties than each of the terms individually. And that's, a, that's what's going to save us. So uh, let me, um, but, but that's of course a very standard, uh, uh, standard PDE, um, PDE idea. And in fact, we can, uh, we can get a pointwise estimate on this. Uh, um, in fact, uh, uh, we can even uh, uh, control the integrand in the uh, L infinity norm. Uh, so uh, not just L2, but L infinity, uh, which is even better because we're always on the unit square, thanks to our periodic boundary conditions. So how do we see this? Uh, we see this by Using so now I'm, I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at this expression evaluated at a point x. So let's forget for a moment that uh, I'm so I'm 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 applying the commutator to some function. Let's call this function v for a moment. Uh, so uh, what's the uh, what's the formula I get? Uh, so. For the first factor, I'm, 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 I'm taking the function, I'm convolving it, and then I'm multiplying. So of course I can put the multiplication inside the integral, so I can write this as g of, uh, uh, g of h, uh, zeta of x, leave a little bit of space, times v of x minus z. And let me erase this. And, uh, uh, and for the second part of the commutator, I'm doing the same thing in the opposite order. I first multiply uh, the, uh, this function with zeta, and then I convolve. So I take a minus x 
uh, minus z here. So that's the, uh, that's the expression. And now you see, uh, just from this simple representation, you see that there is something to gain from the smoothness of the cutoff function because you have a difference here over a small length scale because the kernel concentrates on scale square root of h, so uh, x and x minus z are very close. And that's, uh, that's what, we, uh, what we use. And now we, uh, uh, we remind ourselves that uh, uh, the function v was actually xi x minus z times gradient u x minus z dz. Okay. So, so far we haven't done much besides uh, rewriting the integral. And now the key step is to get rid of this, uh, to get rid of this gradient because we can't, we can't afford the gradient uh, on, uh, uh, on this function because we have no control on that. So, uh, uh, so the idea, of course, is to do an integration by parts and to do an integration by parts in the z variable because we're integrating in the z variable. And which means uh, if I do integration by parts, uh, the gradient will kind of affect everything here, which depends on z. So there are three places where the z is sitting, so we get three terms. So uh, when the gradient falls here, there's no minus sign from partial integration because of the minus z here. So we get gret ghz. Uh, that's a bad term because taking, taking a derivative of this very pointed uh, uh, Gaussian makes, uh, you know, brings in uh, huge slopes, but uh, luckily it's multiplied by this small expression and then also, of course, by that one. So that's the first term. Now the derivative can fall on this term, uh, which gives us uh, now, uh, I don't know about the signs, so, uh, this is unaffected. Uh, there's no minus sign from integration by parts. There is no minus sign from differentiation here, so it should be plus gradient zeta x minus z psi x minus z. And then uh, uh, the gradient falls on this one here, which is plus uh, g of h z uh, zeta of z minus uh, zeta of x minus zeta of x minus z. A gradient psi x minus z and everything is multiplied with uh, u of x minus z dz. Okay, and here uh, the sign is, uh, should be minus sign. Okay, we don't care. We use the triangle inequality anyway. So how can we estimate these things? Uh, so uh, here, we, this term we can estimate by uh, the L infinity norm, by the Lipschitz norm of, uh, um, of the test function zeta, by the uh, uh, L infinity norm of the test vector field psi, and uh, um, u is uh, a function between uh, zero and one, so that's always estimated by one, and we're left with the integral uh, z uh, g h uh, gradient g h uh, d z. So that's the first term. The second term uh, is, estimate is estimated, uh, uh, has the same prefactor, uh, but instead of this integral, you just have the, uh, that integral. And the last term uh, there, uh, we don't need this difference, so we're being very uh, uh, cavalier here and estimate it like this and get again that, okay. And uh, now this uh, binormalization is equal to one. And, uh, and here the gradient is bad, but the z saves you. By scaling you figure out that this is exactly the same expression as if uh, the scale was equal if you were looking at the standard Gaussian and that's of course finite and computable. So, uh, so we get that, uh, that this entire thing here is controlled by uh, the L infinity norm of the gradient of xi and the L infinity norm of xi uh, and vice versa. Okay, so we need some regularity of these test objects, but as I said in the beginning, we don't care at all. 
So that's the advantage of the setup. So that proves, uh, that proves this, uh, uh, this, um, this lemma seven. Uh, so I either can start with lemma eight or I can uh, answer questions. That's a threat, right? I mean, a threat. Either now you have to ask, come up with a question or uh, you have to suffer another proof. It's over. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I always thought that, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I mean, over time, sorry, 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 sorry. My apologies. So I, I went over time and there's no time for questions, which is good. So, uh, so, uh, so that, that, let me just make one sentence. So after, after lunch, uh, you, I mean, then, then I, can, uh, I, can, uh, I can prove the, the next, I can tell you about the next lemma, which is slightly more involved in analytic terms. And, uh, or, you know, I can answer questions or go back to, uh, to lemma six or to, uh, to the proofs from, uh, from last time.